I've been here all week. I'm Vicki Black with the World Affairs Council and welcome to the first uh, Great Decisions uh, lecture for the year. I'm the co-chair of the Great Decisions Committee along with Ellen Levy who unfortunately can't be here tonight. And uh, this is a program, just to calibrate you, this is a program of the Foreign Policy Association of New York City. And they actually select eight different topics to be discussed and debated by thousands of people all around the United States. And, uh, and so we're very lucky to be, have been a part of that as a local sponsor for almost 50 years. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see how many brave souls I have out there that will actually raise their hand to say that they were here uh, at our Great Decisions programs actually back in the 60s. Anybody? Okay, well, and I, and I wasn't, but I would have had I been here in the 60s. Right over here? That's fantastic. How many, uh, um, I will say that I think that those were held at the um, Fountain Street Church, maybe uh, downtown. How many council members are actually out here? A show of hands. Excellent. That's great. Great. We hope to see more of those. Uh, how many here are students who are taking this class and, and assigned these lectures for extra credit? Great. Fantastic. Welcome all of you. And if this is your first lecture as well uh, with us, welcome. And we're so glad to have you here. We hope that you'll take home a brochure. We have one on every uh, lecture that we'll be doing for the next eight weeks. And then also that you'll consider joining the council. I think you'll find it very valuable. Um, incidentally, we'd also like to acknowledge our educational partners that are here, and I believe that Oliver Evans uh, from Kendall College of Art and Design of Ferris State University is here. Uh, so Dr. Evans, if you are here, if, uh, if you could stand and so we can acknowledge you. And sorry, I'm, I'm not seeing a whole lot. All right, well, thank you anyway. Hopefully, we'll see you before the evening is, here, is out. Uh, thank you also this evening to our uh, many sponsors that we're so proud of, uh, BDO, Lewis Padnos Iron and Metal, and Warner Norcross and Judd. And coincidentally, our media sponsor is none other than Michigan Radio and NPR Radio Station. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Dustin Dwyer, the Western Michigan reporter for Michigan Radio, who will introduce our guest. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Vicki. Um, th so I have two main jobs. I was, I was given a script, but I forgot it at home. I was actually just finishing up doing some stories minutes ago um, and getting here. So first off is to thank the World Affairs Council. Um, th they've supported Michigan Radio for a long time, and uh, that support helps us do what we do, obviously. And I think many of you probably individually have supported Michigan Radio, so I want to thank you for that as well. Um, Michigan Radio and the World Affair Affairs Council have similar missions. We try to inform people about the world and help them be engaged and learn more about you know, what they can do in the world. So it, it's been a great partnership and something we hope can continue. Now, we're here tonight to hear Jim Zaroli. And um, for me, I think uh, you, you have his, his bio in your pamphlet, so I won't go into all of that. But for, for me especially, this year, Jim lives in New York, does a lot of reporting on the financial situation. He helps explain what's been going on. And in the past year especially, that's been incredibly important. And the NPR reporters, I think the entire economics team, Jim included, have done just a fantastic job of helping us to understand that. I know they've helped me understand that. So I'm really excited and look forward to hearing from Jim Zaroli. Thank you. So I think I'm wearing three microphones, so I don't know which. I hope one of them is working and you can hear me. Um, <clears throat> I am. Um, I'm. I'm. I'm re really very happy to be here. I am. Um, I've been in Michigan, and in Detroit, um, but this is a different. Being in Western Michigan is a is a pleasant surprise. I and and not at all what I was expecting. It. It looks like a, a a very nice place to live, and I'm sure you all probably feel the same way. Um, I'm not a. Uh, I know this is a the World Affairs Council, and and. This sort of has an international bent to it, I guess, but um, I, uh, I, I do not cover, I'm not an international affairs reporter per se. I cover, I'm sort of a generalist. I cover the economy, I cover business, and uh, have since I think about, I don't even remember, since about 1995. Um, I think that was three recessions ago. Um, 
the uh, I, but 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 it is and and uh, normally I think when they asked me to do that I would have said well you know I don't I'm not a I don't cover international affairs but it really is true it's more than a cliche that the economy is global now and you can't do a story about something happening in the United States and the economy and business without um, it also affecting uh, you know countries overseas and vice versa increasingly um, I became a business reporter I mean I'd, li I'd like to say that I, I did it because I you know I loved business loved economics wanted to tell people about the the economy but really it was just the only job that was open in the New York Bureau um, so I, I and, and that's true I, I had been I think someone was out on maternity leave and I was filling out in for her and then they said well I said well what can I do now and they said well the business reporting job is open and and so I did it um, I mean I come from a family of, of people in business my youngest brother is starting a, a company right now I've watched him uh, do that it's an incredibly painful uh, painful is the wrong word it's a difficult it's a difficult thing to do and, and watching him has given me a, a real sense of empathy, I think, for what small businessmen go through. My father was, you know, an executive at a textile company, uh, very conservative, very, very much uh, hates the government, <laughs> the federal government. I just, I mean, if you ever meet him, I, I just would warn you not to say the words Environmental Protection Agency, because you, you, you will not make a friend. Um, so, but I, I took, I took on the job, and I, you know, I've spent some time in it learning. I'm in New York. I do a lot of coverage of the financial markets, um, you know, business in general, and I, I, I sort of prefer to cover the economy. Um, I think I, I sometimes think I have learned three things that I can say de definitively, and one is that, um, uh, I mean, these were three like sort of moments when I, I sort of realized something. Uh, about the economy. One, one was that the financial markets are opaque because they're meant to be. You're, you, it, they're hard to, to understand and that's, I think that's the way the people in them like it. Uh, the second one is a lot of people have a, sort of an interest, a personal interest in making you think they understand the markets and often they don't and you should always be skeptical of that. And third, especially after living through the past few years, I, I've come to believe that someone who has $20 million is not necessarily rich. Um, you know, there's a lot of money sloshing around New York. It gives you a skewed, much different perspective about money. It really does. And you can make a lot of money in your field. And I'm sure very many people feel this way there. And yet there's always somebody, you know, building his... $30 million dream house in the Hamptons. Um, so it just, it's just a different, I mean, you're, 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 you're exposed to huge amounts of money. Um, I, for a long time I had this beat and it was kind of a sleepy beat, it really was. It was uh, the, the kind of beat that NPR had because they think it's, they know it's important and they know, want somebody to do it, but they don't understand it and they're really happy that you're doing it and you're off there trying to figure it out. Uh, it was not the kind of beat that um, got as much attention as other beats. And then suddenly, about two and a half years ago, that changed and all hell broke loose. Um, I, it's, it's been a very busy time for me. I think it's sort of slowing down now. But of course, every time I, I think that, it, then something else happens. Um, but I find that people... You know, people used to ask me what I do. For, you, know, you go to a dinner party and people ask you, what do you do for a living? And then, of course, and they, and they ask and I'd say it and they'd always say, oh, okay, uh-huh. And now they, they, now they ask me that and they actually are interested. And they, and they ask me questions and they actually sit around and wait for the answers, which is amazing. They, wa they want to know, I mean, they wanted, they wanted me to explain the financial crisis for a long time. That's not so much anymore now it's more I get a lot of questions about where you know is the is this recession over do I really believe it's going things are getting better um, last May I went to Hartford Connecticut to uh, speak to a member station group there and 
I remember um, talking a lot about what had happened to the economy, and, and at the end of it, I said something like, uh, you know, I, I guess I, I, I sort of wanted to leave people on a positive note, so I said that, uh, and, and I knew I was kind of going out on a limb. R reporters uh, have different opinions about this, about how much you should, st you should give your opinion, how much, you know, where does analysis end and opinion begin, and everybody has different ideas about that. Um, but I said at the end of this speech, I said that I really think in, in terms of the economy that, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel, that economists really believe that the recession is going to end perhaps by summer. And now, of course, and when I did that, I thought, I was thinking, you know, that those words could come back to haunt me. But now, I think, um, you know, I, I think I, I, can say definitely that there, there's still light at the end of the tunnel. It's just that the tunnel has proven to be a lot longer than anybody expected. It's kind of like one of those tunnels in the Alps that just goes on for miles. Um, this has been a, a really slow, difficult, painful recovery. You live in Michigan, I don't need to tell you that, but it's, but it's really been everywhere. And the reason for that is I think has a lot to do with the fact that this was a re this was a recession that began in the financial markets. Uh, ordinarily, you know, um, business activity slows for a while, and the Federal Reserve uh, rate, uh, cuts interest rates, and then you gradually businesses start to hire, people start to regain confidence in the economy. The problem this time is there is this added wrinkle, which is that the the banks, the lenders, a lot of people still have um, a lot of bad assets on their books that they're trying to work through. And that makes them reluctant to, to, to fully participate in, in the recovery. Um, so that's why this has been a lot harder to get through. And taking, it's taking a lot longer. Um, but the thing about recessions is they do always end and they end in some of the s some similar ways and this one is ending um you know we saw uh just last week the gdp figures came in and you know the economy grew by i i covered it and i think it was 5.7 percent which was very good um you're seeing things like that all the time you're seeing little little and this has been going on for months little things little signs that the economy is getting better consumer confidence is up industrial production and these things matter a lot um uh, unemployment is still of course the big problem it's a problem in almost everywhere i think except like parts of north dakota um but it, it's it's a, it's a it's a huge problem um and that always is the case at the end of a recession. It's, it is, you've probably heard this, it's a lagging indicator. And businesses don't want to start hiring until uh, they're really confident that things are good and that they're going to stay good. Because when they take someone on, a, a worker, they, they have kind of, you know, they don't want to have to fire them, you know, a little bit later. Um, so that always happens, but it will, you know, I talk to economists that I, I respect a lot who say, this is going to happen, it's going to happen soon, we're going to start to see some growth in the job market. The question is, how much growth? We've just lost so many, just a staggering number of jobs, and it's hard to think that, you know, we can get them back anytime soon. Um, I, I find something strange. Uh, when I have done stories saying things like this, saying, you know, there's evidence that the economy gets better, I, we almost always get um, nasty comments, nasty email. I mean, you know, people in their emails and in their comments on, if you go on the web at all, people are just, can, they can be very vicious, they can be really nasty. Um, and I find it, it's strangely on both the left and the right, um, who don't who, who sort of object if you if you say too much posi too many positive things about the economy it's really strange the um i think the right feels as though uh that with the left the left feel a lot of people on the left i think feel like there's something rotten in the economic system and that if you uh if you say that you're kind of glossing over the the problems i think people on the right feel like if you say that the economy is getting better um, you're just doing it because there are Democrats in control 
and you want to make things look better for them. Um, so I, I do hear from that. I, um, I, I actually wrote down some comments that I got get. I did a, uh, in November, the unemployment report was very strong, and I did a piece on that, and I said, you know, it's strong, but we have a long, long way to, to go to come back. Um, and people wrote in that uh, I was, it was uh, totally bogus, uh, intensely partisan, and then I, this is one we get all the time. I really hate it when, I hate media bias when my tax dollars are paying for it. So that's NPR, you get that all the time. People say that all the time. So then I also did a story on um, new jobs on Wall Street. We did this series on kind of asking the question, uh, where are the new jobs going to come from? When the job growth comes, because a huge number of jobs that people have now didn't exist five years ago. I forget, it's a, it's a really um, unbelievable, like one in four or something. So we did sort of, what, what are the new jobs going to look like? And my, they asked me to do one on Wall Street. And of course, a lot of people, a lot of people think that you shouldn't talk, write anything about the banks or Wall Street at all without a strong tone of moral condemnation in every sentence. And um, so there I got, um, what a nice wet kiss from NPR to Wall Street. <laughs> Still more economics idiocy from NPR. And then this was my favorite. There was something about this story that made me want to get out my pitchfork and torch. <laughs> now I'm, I'm really, like I, I, I come from a family where we're, we don't like criticism and this is not a good way to be to the young people in the audiences. You know, because you should, you should try to listen to criticism and absorb it and learn from it. But I, I never have, I'm not very good at that. And to me, it's like, you know, um, here, going online and reading the comments about my own work is like, you know, it's like being a hemophiliac in a knife store. It's, it's real, it's, I, 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 I don't. But I, I find that over time, the, the, the weird thing is that I think, and I think this is personal growth, actually, but... I find it, it bothers me less because you realize that it's, it's not about you. It's about something, it's about, the, it's about politics, it's about um, people wanting to m use you to make statements about what they think about politics. Even if you're not, if, even if you're not saying anything about politics, you still become kind of a, and sometimes, it's funny because sometimes the comments in our stories go on for, hundreds and hundreds of them, and, it, and they start to argue about something that has absolutely nothing to do with your story. So, so I, am, I am really learning to like just let it roll off my back, which is a major step forward for me. Um, I do wanna, wanna, wanna say, though, that, um, I mean, no journalist likes to uh, seem as though he is or she is saying uh, that things are, are really okay when there are problems that, that might arise. Um, and I, 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 I mean, you don't want to seem naive. And um, so I, I, I don't want to s s say that. Uh, I don't, also don't want to make it look like I'm glossing. When I say that I think that the economy is getting better, I know there's a terrible unemployment problem, of course. I, I mean, I've seen this directly. I, I, I think at one point last year, I, I had eight friends, people that I consider friends, you know, people I knew well and socialized with who had lost their jobs. Um, my youngest brother lost his job. Um, I, I work in the media, uh, and it's a, it's a really terrible field to be in right now. It's just, a, if you lose your job as a reporter, you're probably not coming back. Um, I have a friend, a friend of mine who, I, I, uh, she started out as a wire service reporter for Reuters, and she worked her way up, worked her way up, and got to Business Week as an, as an editor in healthcare. And as you know, Business Week has, it's practically collapsed and was bought by uh, Bloomberg for some you know, shamefully low amount of money. And so my friend is now, Bloomberg also runs a wire service, so they took all the people from Business Week and said, well, Either you're going to lose your job or you're going to come to work for the wire service. So my friend is back where she started in her career, and um, trying, and she's and she's glad. She feels lucky that she's there. So I mean, I've seen, I've seen. I guess my point is that I've seen really terrible things happen, and I know that the the um, 
the economy is is still a, a source of major pain for people. Um, I, I did want to talk. I, so, so I think I think in the interests of um, uh, letting you know that I do appreciate the risks out there. I I thought of um, I wanted to talk about some of the challenges that I think the economy faces. We're now at this in this recovery phase, but I wanted to talk about things. That, five things that I thought of that. Uh, I don't think people think about a lot um, and don't don't realize and this this will all sound very Pessimistic, but I then I want to tell you at the end why I don't think any of it matters anyway, but um, uh, The the first thing that is um, I, I this is I call this challenge one this is like like communist China I'm gonna call these the five challenges so uh, challenge one is um, the foreclosure overhang. I, I know that everybody knows that we've had a tremendous number of foreclosures. I think last year they said three million homes were in the process of foreclosure. In other words, they were heading there if they weren't already there. Um, a lot of people have seen the value of their homes fall and they're underwater, which means they owe more on their property than it's worth. Now the federal government has had programs to try to get banks to uh, restructure the loans. And it hasn't really made much of a dent in the problem so far. Uh, a lot of banks have just been really, really slow to restructure, to let people refinance. Um, but the economy is recovering. So this, should, this problem should go away. But the problem is with foreclosures is it won't go away as fast as we would like. And that's because there's always a kind of a pipeline problem with foreclosures. Um, people uh, who are way, people who get 10 months behind on their mortgages, uh, they then owe all that money. They owe the interest, they owe penalties. So they're looking at a huge amount of money that they owe. Uh, so even if they find a job that pays well and can start to pay their mortgage on a monthly basis, they often don't want to, especially if the property's underwater. So the point is that we're gonna get a lot more foreclosures and foreclosures are the source, you could argue, of, this, of the trouble we're in. Um, they are why all these funny mortgage-backed securities lost value uh, and um, that's that's a real that's a that's a real risk going forward. Until we get that problem under control, uh, you know we're 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 going to have some some cha we're going to have a challenge ahead of us. The second thing I wanted to talk about, and this is I think a lot of economists say this is the mi big problem right now for the Federal Reserve. Um, the federal government and the Federal Reserve have poured so much money into the economy lately. Um, you know the Federal Reserve's job when the economy is weak, they lower interest rates, and the feeling is it then becomes cheaper to borrow and that will spur economic activity. Well, they did that early on, and it didn't really work. Uh, interest rates are very, very low, almost as low as they can be, and it still hasn't made, it still hasn't spurred the, the, the economic activity that people thought it would. So the Fed has done now done this other thing called quantitative easing, which I won't try to explain, but it's a way of getting money into the system, adding liquidity. Um, that seems to have worked a bit. Um, the uh, one area where we, we are seeing, just one area where we're seeing a huge amount of fed, federal money poured into the system is in the area of mortgages. And I think this is, this is incredible. I heard a statistic that, um, well, uh, let me, uh, jump, jump back a bit. They, what's happened is the Federal Reserve has gone into the business of buying mortgage-backed securities, buying people's mortgage assets. At the same time, the Federal Housing Administration, whose job it is to back mortgages, has played a much, much more aggressive role in this than they used to because they have to, because the private mortgage market has just kind of ground to a halt. So the FHA had to step in. Some people say they're taking a lot more risk on that they shouldn't, and this is gonna be a problem down the road. We also have the VA, uh, which also, um, I believe, guarantees mortgages. But anyway, the statistic that I heard was that 
90% of all the mortgages that were issued last year were done so with some form of federal backing or guarantee. So 90%, that's a huge amount. So the federal government is really propping up the mortgage market right now. At some point, they, ha they will step away. At some point, they'll say, you know, we, uh, the economy's in good enough shape, we can do that. And in fact, the Federal Reserve has already said in March they're going to stop buying mortgage-backed securities. When that happens, the private mortgage market will have to step in, and uh, there will be much less demand for mortgages, and you can almost bet that interest rates are going to go up when that happens. Um, that, that's, a, that's a real problem going forward, because as I said, mortgages were the epicenter of this crisis. And if the mortgage market weakens, we're gonna see more foreclosures, we're gonna see more banks struggling with their balance sheets. Um, so that's a, that's a big problem too. A lot of people say that that is, the Fed unwinding is the real challenge. The federal government is going to have to decide when to back out. And if they do it too soon, they risk a, 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 the recession coming back. And if they wait too long, they risk inflation growing. So it's really a timing issue. That's going to be, everybody says that's, that's the real challenge for Ben Bernanke. Um, other problem, I, uh, I think the third area I wanted to talk about is commercial real estate. You guys may have heard about this. Um, we're coming off a huge boom in commercial real estate. Every time people say, you know, a lot of people say on the right that we got into this mortgage problem because of, uh, the Community Reinvestment Act, which sort of forced banks to lend to people who shouldn't have gotten mortgages. And that may be true, but it doesn't explain why there was so much, um, um, so, so much lending in so many other areas, too, with areas that have nothing to do with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac or the Community Reinvestment Act. And, the, and one of them is commercial real estate. It was just amazingly easy for a long time to get money to build a shopping mall or a, you know, like a condo complex in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, just, you could, you could get money very easily. Um, and we saw that in New York. We, we, we've seen, you know, I, I did a story on, on one office building uh, that was purchased, it was the most money ever spent on an office building. They're, they're having trouble paying their debts. Now. I forget the name of the, it's on Fifth Avenue. But there was another thing you may have heard about two complexes, uh, Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper Village in Manhattan. Uh, they are two um, large, very large, I think like, I, I don't know, like 11,000 apartment units, many buildings on the, in the East 20s in Manhattan. They were, these complexes were built by MetLife uh, in 2006, a group of investors came along, led by Tishman Spire, and decided, well, what a great investment, because, you know, you don't lose money in real estate. Um, so they bought, so they spent a lot of money on, on buying these properties, and uh, $5.6 million, billion, which was just considered a, just a staggering amount. And even at the time, people said, ah, you'll never get that bad. I mean, that's crazy. They believed that rent control laws were being phased out, which is true in New York, and they would be able to pay off the debt. Well, they never were able to pay it off, and last week, they said they were walking away from the, the investment. So in other words, Tishman Spire, which put $200 million into this, is just saying, we can't pay this off anymore, keep the money. And the lenders now have these properties. So we're going to see, more, everybody who follows commercial real estate says we're going to see more, more defaults like that. It's just bound to happen. The banks have been delaying. The banks, see the banks who lent all this money to people to buy this stuff, they don't want to uh, restructure the loan. They don't want to. They they do everything possible to get people to hold, to, to try to keep paying it off because they don't want to write it off. Uh, it's called in the commercial real estate business. It's called extend and pretend, which is a term I like. <laughs> Often what they'll do is they'll they'll uh, they'll get um, you know you'll get one uh, uh, owner who can't pay. And so the bank will try to find somebody else who will take over the mortgage and, and pay, but do it on the same terms. And of course, nobody can do that because the, the thing just doesn't bring in the cash that, that it's supposed to. 
Um, so this is a real big problem. It's a problem for confidence in the real estate market because when you see these, these, um, these big properties fail, uh, it just makes people, they get huge headlines and they, it makes people even more scared about, about investing. Um, so that, that, that's a real, a lot of people think that's the other shoe to drop in real estate. First we had subprime, we're gonna have commercial real estate. Um, there's also the, the, uh, the, the fourth area that I, I think we can talk about is, is, uh, is I, I, you, I guess you could say sovereign risk. Um, you know that the U.S. has been building up a very large budget deficit. The U, uh, other countries all over the world have also been borrowing a tremendous amount of money, in some cases even more than we have. And they do this because the economy is slow, the revenue, tax revenues are down, they need money to stimulate the economy and keep people employed. Um, and they can do that now because money is still cheap. Uh, in the U.S., you know, as much as we're borrowing, we're still paying pr a pretty low rate for the money that we borrow. Um, but at some point, that's going to change, and its interest rates are going to have to go up, and you're going to find a lot of countries with more debt on their books than they can handle. Um, we're now hearing right now the the problem child is Greece. Greece has. And, and it, begin, it, becomes, it begins as a whisper campaign. You know, people say, oh, it seems like Greece can't pay its debt. And then Greece always comes out and says, oh, we're fine. This isn't a problem. But the more people whisper, the, the less investors want to want to buy up the Greek bonds. And so the more Greece has to pay for the bonds. So the higher the interest rates go and the worse the problem gets. And, the, and Greece is a very small economy, so it doesn't matter. But well, I mean, it does. It, it matters to the Greeks, but it, it it's not it's not a, a it's not like you know China defaulting, um, if you can imagine that. But uh, it, it, there is this risk of contagion when one country goes, and we've seen this again and again. Uh, people will start to say, "Well, what about what about some of the other countries in in Southern Europe?" Actually, there's this acronym now. I guess have you guys heard of one acronym that I like is BRIC. Have you heard that? It means Brazil, Russia, India, and China, and those are fast-growing, developing countries. But then the other one is pigs, and that, I believe, is Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain. And those are the southern European countries that have borrowed a lot and, and about which there, might, there are questions about whether they can pay back the loans. And that, and that might not be true. I mean, in any of those countries may be in a perfectly good position uh, to pay them off. But again, that this is, you know, begins as a whisper campaign. It's almost like if people lose confidence in these countries to pay back their debts, then they can't pay them back. Because as I said, their interest rates are affected. Uh, and we've seen this again and again. In the 90s, this, 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 this risk of contagion has happened. When one country has trouble, then it tends to spread kind of like a disease. And if that happens, uh, it, it, could, it could be very bad for the global economy because you can't have Europe affected by you know, a downturn like that without having the US and China and Canada affected as well. Finally, the, other, the last thing I wanted to talk about, which I think is, um, I think a lot of people are probably might think this is crazy, but I um, I heard about it a few months ago, and then I've, I hear more and more about it. Um, China has been the United States is not the only country that is doing the stimulus program. China, lots of countries are. Germany did a lot, but China has been putting a lot of money into economic stimulus, and uh, they, they they take the money. They have huge foreign reserves, so they're sending it out to be into. They're lending it out to somebody to upgrade his factory, or they're building a bridge. Uh, you know, they're building roads. They're doing all this stuff. That's that's good. I mean, it can be good as investment. But um, there are people who think that China is 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 kind of re recklessly lending. That it's putting up things that. Uh, don't have any economic justification. And when you do that, you can create the conditions for a bubble. And in fact, um, there's a hedge fund manager named Jim Chanos in New York who has been right about these things before and so is respected, who thinks China is a bubble. He thinks it's, this is a bubble that's going to pop and that uh, 
China is going to have trouble. Uh, China, you will find that China has lent out a lot of money to people who can't pay it back, and and uh, if that happens, if that's going to if China is the driver in 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 the Asian Asian economy right now, and that's going to be very painful for a lot of people. But as I said, a lot of people, I think most people would say that's that's crazy. I mean, China is an economy that's so strong and has grown so much that I guess I'm saying take that with a grain of salt. But it's a big potential potential problem. Now. Um, I guess I want to, I just want to say in general, I, maybe I'm just, I tend to be a little bit more optimistic. Maybe, maybe it's just by nature. But I have, I have, uh, I think the U.S. I, I, the reason I don't, I, I, I've seen problems like talked about before often that didn't turn out to be as bad as people thought they were. I, I've just seen this enough. Um, I think the U.S. economy uh, is, is a very resilient one. Um, I, 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 my experience doing this is that the conventional wisdom is wrong so often that you should probably just almost always question it. Um, in my, you know, just I, I, I started to think about some of the things that people always said that turned out to be untrue. One was Japan was going to take over the world. You probably remember that, like back in the 80s when we all thought Japan was going to be the you know, the strongest economy and was going to take over. And it, and it didn't quite, it's a strong economy, but it didn't quite happen that way because Japan also has a lot of economic problems. Um, I remember when people said in the 90s that you can't have 4% unemployment, that if you do that, you're going to uh, have inflation. And that was an article of faith among economists for a long time until we had 4% unemployment and we didn't have much inflation at all. Um, and finally, I, I remember when everybody said, you can always refinance your mortgage later. <laughs> and that, that's certainly not the case. So I speak from experience on that one. Um, so I, I guess I just want to end by saying I, I don't, I, I, I've come to always question the conventional wisdom in economic matters. I, I think it's just in the nature of the economy that there are always changes under the surface, things happening that we don't know about yet, good and bad. If we knew about them, if it was obvious, if it were obvious, you, you could go out and make a lot of money because there, there would be a way to do it if you knew for sure. But most things that have happened in the economy have caught people off guard. So that's why when I hear people talk about how, you know, how bad the economy is doing right now, I always want to say, but, but, you know, or, or, if they're too optimistic, I want to say that too, which I guess is just um, just part of being a reporter. But um, I I I, uh, I guess the the bottom line that, we, that that's and I think that's an optimistic th thought, really, which is that you know you know no one ever got rich following the crowd. It's just just by nature you you can't do that, and and most people never see coming the changes that ultimately do come in the economy and i i just so i'm i've become very much of a contrarian and and i uh, i think that's probably the only way you can be really in in this day and age so anyway thank you i um this has been a lot of fun i like to you know pontificate i'm always willing to do it so thank you Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, we do have questions uh, and answer period that Jim is delighted to help us with. Uh, we have two roving microphones here. So if, uh, if you see Dixie are, are right over here uh, helping us with that. And I have one right in the back, thank you. that you talk to economists that you respect a lot. I'm curious who it is that you talk to and why. Um, you know, I, I have a bunch of like six or ten people that I go to a lot because I know they're, they're always going to give me something intelligent 
to say. Uh, you know, you've probably heard a lot of their names. Um, you know, one guy that I like to talk to is Lakshman Ashathan. He's with the Economic Cycle Research Institute, which is very good at predicting changes in the economic cycle. Um, he's one, but I'm, you know, I'm, will, I'm open to, and I like to try to talk to new people as well. Um, yeah. We, uh, it, it's, it's a fun, yeah, I have to say, it's, it, there are an awful lot of economists who will talk to you, and um, I, I, I would talk to a lot of them. A lot, uh, one reason why some get on the air and some don't is because they're just available more. But uh, that's that's a nasty little trade secret, I guess. But um, but I you know you know I I talk to I talk to a lot of them, a lot of different people. Okay, I can't. See. Okay. What do you see the challenges uh, that are blocking the uh, liquidity in the banking and financial? <laughs> institutions. You mean if we do? What, what would uh, resolve with the lack of liquidity to address the challenges that you presented from the banking industry? You know, that is, that is such a tough question. I, um, you know, I just, Joseph Stiglitz is a great economist at Columbia. I just wrote a book that he I read a book that he wrote called Free Fall. He made a very good case in there that um, we should have just probably let the banks go and restructured them. Uh, you, know, you know, I know that in that whole period when we were deciding what to do with the banks, it was happening incredibly fast. It was very scary. I believe they probably were doing the best they could. Whether they did the right thing, I don't know. Um, they don't know, probably. It's going to be de 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 debated by historians. But, um, I mean, they, you can certainly make the case that they have stabilized the banking system. Um, they have avoided the worst. But it hasn't r quite provided the liquidity. It hasn't provided the lending that I think at least the politicians were hoping for. Um, you know, from the point of view of the banks, who are already in a weak condition, some of them, some of them are doing well. Um, you know, why, why should they make loans to people if they don't think that the people are going to be able to pay them back? But the fact is, if we don't, if we don't get more lending, if we don't get more, if the banks don't step up to the plate, uh, it's going to be a lot harder to really pull out of the, the recession. Techni technically, we're already out of the recession. I, also, I want you to know, it just doesn't feel like it yet. Welcome to Grand Rapids. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, question I'm on the stimulus bill. I recently, when I drive on a highway, you always see this. This program is funded by the TARF fund. And I was driving on Fulton here, and there's an old building in the Fulton market, and it says funded by the TARF fund. I thought we were in trouble at that point. Um, yeah, that's about the TARF fund. <coughs> American Investment Re Re Reinvestment Act, the stimulus, yeah. not the TARF fund. So, how well is the stimulus going? I know it, uh, jobs are a lagging indicator. Uh, um. Honestly, I don't, I don't. I haven't seen many economists of, of any political stripe. I, I'm sure people can. I'm sure I'm wrong. There's some, but who who don't think that the stimulus probably did some good? Um, how much good is a is a question, but it did something. Um, you know, was it enough? I, I don't even think the, the Congress and the Obama administration thought at the time it was going to be enough to turn things around completely. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of liberal economists like Paul Krugman who think that we just never put enough money into it. Um, but I, I, I th you know, I'm, I'm not an economist and I can't say, but it certainly seems like the people that know think that it made a difference. It's just not enough. To, I mean, this was a hard, this was a really severe recession and a really scary, dangerous time for the economy. Um, 
and I think you could you could make an argument that all of the steps they took, the sta effort to stabilize the banks, they all played a role. But you know, it's kind of hard to sell that message politically right now because people see the unemployment and they they think I I I, I actually was in in my gym the other day and. Uh, they, somebody had the TV on, and CNN has been doing these series about the, the stimulus funds. And, and a lot of it, from what I saw, was like, you know, they'd go out to some place in Montana that used the money to rebuild a tennis court, and they'd say, see, they're wasting your money, see? And so this, store, this series was on, and, uh, and I, this guy was standing there, and I know he wasn't, wasn't political or anything. It, it, it wasn't ideological, and, I, and he just said, you know, they took all that money and wasted it and gave it to the banks. And I remember thinking, you know, he's, he's wrong about that in a number of ways, but that's what people think. That's the political reality, so it almost doesn't matter. So um, it, it's a real problem. I mean, because a lot of people would say we need more stimulus, but politically that seems to be kind of a non-starter right now. Yeah. Thank you. I too have a question about the banks. Doesn't the phrase too big to fail hold the American taxpayer hostage to the banking system? And do you expect that Congress will make any kind of meaningful reform, such as perhaps bringing back the Glass-Steagall Act or some other kind of financial reforms to try to prevent that from happening again? Well, it's certainly a, a, a fair assumption to make if they're too big to fail. Um, you know, we and the, the taxpayers have to step in, and they're t they're too big to exist. And that, that's a lot of people think that. And um, I thought I, I think that uh, the Vol you might have seen about the Volcker Volcker rule, named for Paul Volcker, uh, which I think it was about two weeks ago they came out and said that, which would limit the amount of proprietary trading that banks could do if they're backed up by the by taxpayer money, essentially. I think I'm saying that right. But that, that's, that was a good first step. And, and everybody said that, even the, like the Wall Street Journal editorial page even approved of that. As a, but, it's a, but it's one step. And I think a lot more needs to be done in terms of financial market regulation, and we're not doing it. I don't see, I think a lot, the, uh, early on there were people who said, we should have done this right away. As soon, you know, in April of 2009, they should have been. They should have pushed something through, because that was when the memories of the meltdown were fresh, and politically, the ground was fertile to do something like that. And we've waited too long. I know that Congress is still talking about uh, reforms, and I hope they do something good. But um, the longer they go, and the worse the political situation gets, it's just it's it's hard to see what they're really going to get accomplished. Uh, hi. Thanks for coming here and I enjoyed your lecture. Uh, the question I'm about to ask may sound a bit populist, you know, politician kind of thing, but when you think about it deeply, it kind of makes sense. Instead of shoveling the money directly to the banks, wouldn't a homeowner bailout kind of help the assets, which in turn would have helped the banks? I'm sorry, which? A bailout for the homeowner in terms of you know writing up a mortgage or something, so that the underwater you know mortgages underwater would not have happened. At the same time, helping out the banks, which have all these assets, you know, bad assets on their balance sheets. Yeah. In other words, was there a better way to spend the money? Yeah. Directly uh, yeah. giving it to the banks. Well, I, I mean, I'm not taking a position one way or another, but I, I will tell you the opposite argument, which is, I mean, you probably know what moral hazard is. If you allow people to take reckless risks with their money and then they lose money and you rush in and help them and prop them up, um, you're creating a situation where they won't, next time they'll do, they'll, they'll do even more. They'll, they'll do something even more reckless because they know you're going to come in and help them. Uh, I think a lot of people feel like, well, those people who got in over their heads with their mortgages, um, if, if you let the government come in and help them now, 
yeah, might keep them in their homes, but how is that fair? If I pay my mortgage and the guy next door to me, you know, uh, borrowed too much and got out a home equity loan and took a trip with the money and now he's over, now he's in over his head, uh, how is that fair if he gets propped up and I don't? And I think there would be a lot of, a lot of, uh, there would be a political backlash to that. I'm, I mean, again, I'm not taking a position. I don't know what the right thing to do is, but I know that's, I know that's the sort of problem that you contend with there. So, yeah. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, I remember Tom Friedman the other day in your time saying that uh, this may be the end of Washington consensus, which basically claims that uh, free elections and open markets uh, leads to great growth and development. And maybe it's the beginning of Beijing consensus in which uh, state-owned banks and uh, state mobilization of resources leads to growth and development. Do you think it's the, one of these uh, conventional wisdoms that we should neglect, or is there something else? That reminds me of back in the 80s when everybody said, we have to make our factories more like Japan. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I certainly think our, our economic credibility has been greatly undermined. I mean, this was a financial crisis that, you know, we, we, we don't export much, but we exported that. You know, we exported our, our, um, our, our reckless lending habits. We really did. A lot of countries pick, pick them up, and uh, that has to undermine our credibility. I, I don't whether, and I don't know, China, I'm not a China expert. I don't, I don't want to pretend that I am, but it seems like they have problems of their own, too. So I, I don't know. Back to the um, uh, reform side of things. Uh, back when Enron drove themselves out of business uh, through the use of unregulated derivative investments, yeah. uh, <clears throat> Congress took a, a real swing at that problem with Sarbanes-Oxley, and they totally whiffed on it, in my opinion. And here we are again, AIG has done the same thing with mortgage-backed securities as good as. Yeah. Is there any sense at all that, from your perspective, that the national leadership recognizes any of this this time as being one of the underlying causes and is going to do something on the reform front? That's a good question. I, I, I Yeah, I, I think they want to do certain things. I mean, there's been talk about changes in the derivatives market. Whether it's going to be enough, I don't know. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the Massachusetts election has changed everything. I don't think that the, I, I don't think it's clear at all what we can get out of, out of Congress. I mean, it threw everything into doubt. So I, I, I just don't, I don't know. But it would be, I mean, to my mind, if you don't come out of something like this, lear having learned something, and making some changes, I mean, that, that seems kind of insane to me. I know you said uh, you're not a specialist on foreign policies and stuff, but just wondering what's, how do you foresee our military intervention in other countries and the uh, big amount of money we are spending each day and even every minute as we speak? How do you see that happening in the future? Is it going to decrease or? Well, I don't know. I, I would think that that military spending was kind of one of those politically untouchable areas. But that, uh, John Boehner was on, you know, the head of the Republican, the Republican leader in Congress, I think, in the House. He was on Meet the Press the other day, and he actually said, "I think we should look at wasteful spending in the Pentagon." So, so that was. I thought that was kind of amazing, but. Um, you know, the budget deficit is just, it just, there is a really good essay in the Center for American Progress, I think, wrote it, um, and it was called Budget Peacocks, and it was a great essay. It was like, I just, I, I loved it. It was, uh, it, basically, the point is, our budget deficit is so huge right now and getting bigger that it's going to require, it's going to require everybody working together, but it's going to require tax increases and it's going to require uh, big cuts in, in services and entitlement programs and anyone who's really serious about the budget deficit knows that and if people talk about this as though it's 
it's just a matter of cutting, you know, a few earmarks or something. They're not being serious, and that's what this guy calls them, budget peacocks. Anyway, I recommend that to you if you haven't. Yes. Yes. Yeah, uh, I, you know, I'm not much of an expert on on uh, political campaign contributions. I, I don't know that much about it. It seems, you know, I could put on my cynical hat and say that I'm sure that it's just going to cause a, you know, just a free free fall of, you know, everybody's going to be putting, I mean, you, like, does anybody think we need more political campaign commercials? I, I, I just, I think that, but that's kind of just my opinion. I, I, you know, the bank CEOs, I don't know, we have this system where uh, we're just not like other countries in that regard. We, people do stuff and get away with it and, and uh, they don't, I don't, I don't want to say do stuff like, I'm, I'm, they, they, people who make big mistakes with their shareholders' money don't necessarily pay for it the way they do in other countries. I, I don't, you know. It's just a, it's, it's, doesn't make sense to me. To the right here. Um, hi, Jim. Hi. Uh, you mentioned uh, exports before, and uh, Michigan actually doubled its exports to China in the last year. Really? And I wonder if you might speak to the role that um, actually world exports, not only from the United States, but the work could have on uh, resolving the. How did, it, how did Michigan do that? Pardon? How, how did Michigan do that? How did they do that? Yeah, what did they export that they. Um, Yeah, well, that's great. That's wonderful. Um, I mean, that's you know, if, it, it it would be uh, the the reason we have this huge balance of payments problem right now is because we we import everything and we export a lot less, and that uh, countries get our dollars and hold on to them, and then they send them back in the form of treasury bills, and and it's just an unsustainable path, and ev everyone knows it. Yeah, it can't. At some point, that's going to come back to haunt us. And and one way to change that would be to export a lot more. Um, it's just, uh, you know, it's it's going to have. It's going to take a solid uh, effort on the part of a lot of people to really turn that around because it's just it's just, it's it. The problem just seems to get worse. Although I, it did seem like we increased the last GDP report said we increased our exports a bit, which is good. So. Yeah. Hi, thank you, and uh, welcome to Michigan. Um, thank you. I, I wanted to draw the lens down to the average everyday person in the sense that um, throughout the baby, boom, baby boomers growth cycle, we were taught to spend, 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 buy, yeah. buy, buy. And in the last, I, I recently I heard that the average person has saved around $15,000 $15, toward retirement. Yeah. So now we're all being encouraged to save. Yeah. having an impact on things such as retail and other things people would normally be buy, 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 and we're not doing that anymore. And where's, where's that move going to take us in the sense of going from spending to saving? Um. You know, I, I guess I'm, I, I don't know whether I, I'm skeptical that Americans will stop buying. I think they just like, <laughs> shopping is too important. Uh, you know that again is unsustainable. It's it's a huge problem. We don't, we just uh, we we can't keep that up. It's um, if you look at the the budget deficit, um, this this issue of the baby boomers getting older is is just it's a huge issue. Uh, not so much with Social Security, but with Medicare in particular. Um, we we just are going to owe so much. I mean, look at the numbers. Sometimes it's just it's staggering. It really is. And. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's a it's a shame. It really is. People were told, uh, you know, we kind of moved away from defined benefit pension plans into these defined contribution plans, and I know a lot of people are going to going to have a they're going to have a nasty surprise when they retire. I, I don't. Uh. Yeah. Corporations. Yes. Offshore 
many, many jobs throughout the United States. And it was reported, I believe, in the paper this evening that a million jobs in Michigan uh, have been lost since in the last decade. Not all of them, of course, have been shipped overseas, but nationwide, this has become sort of a model for, for corporations' profitability. Yeah. And when we lose jobs here in, in the United States, it causes unemployment, it causes a problem with people to pay their mortgages, keep their insurance policies, yeah. and in a multitude of other situations, such as purchase power. Uh, what do economists have to say about corporate responsibility in this regard? I don't know, economists acknowledge corporate responsibility in that sense, but, uh, you know, honestly, it's, it's, a, it's a thorny issue because we've, we've in my lifetime, I, this amazing thing has happened, which is that, I mean, I remember when I was just out of college and I went and looked for a pair of running shoes and they were $69, and I remember thinking, that's a lot of money, I don't know if I should spend that much. And now, when I go to buy running shoes, they're still $69. They're really cheap. And they're cheap because we make them in China. And, and uh, so many things are so expensive, in, inexpensive, so many things are so cheap that didn't used to be. We just have this capacity to buy stuff. I mean, it's just such a consumer society. There's so much stuff. Like, if you go into other countries and look at the way people live, they just don't have as much stuff as we do um, in, in every way. And that's because, to a great degree, we make it in China and it's cheaper there. And I, I don't, I, you know, it's, it's a conundrum because, you know, people, do, it costs Americans manufacturing jobs, of course. It's, it's, it's a terrible thing. Um, but the same people who, you know, you know, Americans also buy those cheap products. Uh, I, I don't know what you do about that. Um, y you know, it's, it's, corporations do that because they think they can, they can make products cheaper, and it is about profits, but it is true. It's cheaper to, to make things in China. I mean, that's just, that's just the reality of it. And, I, and, I'm not, and I'm not saying that's a good thing at all, but that's why it happens. It happens because people, we like to go out and buy things and we don't want to spend very much money for them. So. Thank you for coming to West Michigan. One of my personal economic data points or data streams that I use is the house that I sold in California uh, in 1995. It was, I sold it for 183000 And then I look at these websites that estimate how much the house is worth. And, 2005, it was 660000 And I think, thank God I don't live there anymore because I would have borrowed against that house and yeah. just had payments that I never would be able to recover from. So I'm glad to have been living in a flat housing market for the last 10 years. And, you know, <laughs> it seems to me, based on just for me that data point, that a large part, if not the biggest part, of this housing bubble was really caused by credit cards and home equity loans, remodeling, refinancing. Uh, do you have a, a sense of how much is really caused by that? I, I think that was a huge factor. We, real estate, too much of our productive capacity was put into real estate, into, you know, um, renovating homes and buying stuff for the home, house and yeah you know, it's just, it's 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 a but you know it's it's we i we couldn't we couldn't keep that up and we're not we're not going to but it doesn't seem like there's a lot of recognition of that in, about that. nobody seems willing to change well i think people are changed now because the housing market has fallen apart uh, I, and, and it's suddenly you, it's you can't get those home equity line of credit lines of credit as easily anymore. I mean, I don't know if you've tried to refinance, but it's a different world. It really is. I mean, I I felt I remember I remember talking to mortgage brokers. I think I could have borrowed anything I wanted five ten years ago, five years ago, and you just can't do that anymore. It's just it's a different world. 
I'm really lucky because I live in a co-op, you know, in New York City, uh, and they strictly limit how much people can borrow against their property. You first, you have to have equity. You have to have twenty percent, and they don't. They don't. No, no waivers on that. You have to have it. And in fact, the really nice buildings want you to have fifty or even a hundred percent. But you can't. You couldn't do those liar loans and no doc mortgages and. Um, so I was lucky in that regard, but but it's it's a lot of people you know are still paying the price for it. you still have one of those home equity lines of credits that's you charged up to the max and it's they're hard to pay off they really are. Yeah. Hi, my question is: Do you think with the quantitative, like all the money that's being printed, that our dollar is going to stand a chance of collapsing? Um, God, I, I feel like I'm not enough of an expert to say. I, I, I know there are certainly people who worry about that. They worry about... I don't think it's, it's collapsing. Uh, I, I know that... The, the problem is that the main buyers of our, of our dollars, the, pe the people who hold our dollars, once you hold them, you, have a, you don't want the, the value of them to fall too quickly, so you have to sort of hold on to them. If China suddenly decided it didn't want to hold all our all our dollar reserves and started getting rid of them, that would be a pretty much of a nightmare. But China's not going to do that. But I don't know in terms of currency falling on, you know, in in some ways it might be a, not be a bad thing because suddenly, you know, we could manufacture again and we could people would want to buy our products. I I don't I don't know. But currency is a funny thing. I don't I guess I don't feel like I can talk that much about it. Hi, um, thank you for uh, coming to West Michigan. I just wanted to say that I also am very optimistic, but um, it's always a but, right? Um, but when uh, President Obama was elected, he said things like, you know, you can't continue to drive your SUVs and those sorts of things. And while I think our economy will come back, it seems like the, the extent to which it, it will come back is really the question. It's not whether or not we can get back to the three percent growth, but whether or not that we're willing to accept a lower standard of living in order to pursue uh, other goals. Like, uh, for example, um, where you look at Western Europe and their economies, they've accepted a lower level of growth so that they could have um, what they feel is a more equitable society. And it seems like there's a strong contingent in the United States that feels the same way that we need to somehow, you know, that it's un unfair for us to be as prosperous as we are and we have to limit our growth in order to pursue those goals. And I guess my question for you is, considering that the, um, that the government um, expenditures as a percent of GDP continue to rise way beyond historic levels, and even though the economy's come back, we're talking about putting regulations on energy. We're talking about um, you know nationalizing you know whole industries, and they have actually done that. Um, and tax cuts are going to be re expire for from the Bush tax cuts. But don't those uh, inhibit our potential to grow? Um, I mean, there, there's a lot, lot in there. Um, <laughs> no, I know. I, I mean, I, I understand where you're coming from. Um, you know, we, ha our budget deficit. One of the things that's not fully appreciated is that um, we have a big budget deficit, and it's getting bigger. Um, part of that is because of spending. Part of that, and that was spending by. You know, a huge amount was done toward the end of the Bush administration by the Democratic Congress and the Bush administration working together. Some of it's been done more recently. Um, one of the reasons we have a huge budget deficit is because when the economy slows, tax revenues get lower. And that's one of the things that's happening right now. If the economy rebounds nicely, we'll be in a better position. 
but even then we we have an you know unsustainable budget deficit it's just it's huge it's i i'm really concerned about that i really am and i don't think we have the the political will to deal with it at all and there are economists who say you know at some point your the, if you owe, uh, I think I think people, I think the consensus is it's like 90% of your total debt level reaches like 90% of your uh, of uh, of your GDP. Then that really starts to cut into growth. Then that be, it becomes your your the amount of interest you have to pay all the time is so high that. Uh, you have no money left for anything, and it really it really does affect growth. So I, th I think it's a really serious problem, but I also think it's not going to, you know, those those tax cuts by the Bush administration they they were a big part of why we're in a deficit now, why we, why we have that problem. I mean, we we it's like both sides are not have not been talking seriously about about the budget deficit. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I mean, I actually think about that a lot. That's. We have a question over here on the right. Okay. Two more questions. Here on the uh, right. Yeah, um, the, uh, you, you talked about the residential mortgage crisis and uh, the commercial real estate uh, situation. There was also used to be some talk about a credit card uh, crisis with the banks, whether they, they were going to lose a lot from defaulting credit card holders. And I'm curious whether that's just small in comparison or, or whether that's also a, a problem. And uh, also, uh, um, how did the banks recently make so much money? Is it just the low interest rates that they've been able to use uh, um, in the context of trading and investment banking or, uh, or uh, for another reason? Well, I, the credit card thing, I think, uh, I think all of the major banks I might be wrong, all of them, maybe not, but but I do know that some of them said when they released their uh, earnings reports recently that they're seeing more defaults on consumer loans of all kinds. So that's that's getting to be a problem, and maybe not the most important problem they face, but that's that that happens when you have a recession. Um, and also because, you know, they overextend, you know how easy it was to get credit cards. They overextended themselves. Um, uh, the second, uh, uh, why they, the banks made so much money. They say, uh, di different banks say s different things, but, but a lot of it is like trading. They have, it's really easy now for them to get money because the, you know, cheaply from the government and they've done a lot of trading uh, and, and that's, that's basically it. Their profits are up as a result of that. They do, you know, they do their own trading. They have their own proprietary accounts that they, and that's my understanding of how they, they've basically been doing so well. And, you know, keep in mind, some of them were in a lot of trouble. Like Bank of America was one that was in a lot of trouble. But Goldman Sachs was never in a lot of trouble. Um, so, so each of them is kind of in a different position. I think we have one last question here. Yeah. Good evening. My question is about uh, mark to market. Uh, uh, could you explain that? What the role was back in the? Uh, you know, we're going to put people to sleep all over the room. <laughs> no, isn't there an entertaining way to do that? Um, I keep. Mark to market accounting has to do with um, if you're a bank and you have a lousy. Uh, if, if you have all these assets on your books, you own uh, some mortgage-backed securities, and uh, you don't know what they're worth because you know the mortgage-backed securities are generally, uh, are, you know, in a lot of trouble. The mortgage business is tanked, and and these are probably not worth what you think they're they were worth. Uh, so how do you? What do you put on your books? Um, do you put what you think they're worth now, or do you think you know, or what they're worth, you know, what they should be worth. Um, now, this is a big issue for banks because uh, if they if they uh, uh, if they change their books to to reflect the fact that their assets have lost value, then because of bank regulations, that means they can lend less, so that weakens them. So there was this big debate about. Uh, during the height of the financial crisis about um, should, how should banks be forced 
what should what should banks be forced to put on their balance sheet? Should they say what this used to be worth, or should they say what they think it's worth now? And that was the debate. Now, the problem that the banks said was, you know, we have these assets, we have these mortgage-backed securities, and at that time, you know, like late 2008, early 2009, nobody was buying them. That market was dead. It's still comatose, but back then it was completely dead. So how do you judge what these should be worth? I mean, how do you know what an asset is worth if no one's buying it? And so I think they were putting a lot of pressure on regulators to change accounting standards. And I, my, my recollection is that they did get them to actually issue a statement uh, giving them a lot more leeway about how they record these assets. Uh, and a lot of people were horrified by that because, you know, where else can you do that? <laughs> You know, you, you, you know what, what, how can you put down on your balance sheet not what the thing is worth, but what you think it should be worth? I mean, so, so that, that was, but that was one that I think the banks kind of got a victory on. So that's mark to market accounting, and that's the debate. So. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Put all my microphones away. Okay. <laughs>